In section three, we're going to extend our angle properties from triangles to polygons. So our definition of polygon is a figure with three or more straight enclosed sides, which does mean that a triangle is a polygon. Poly meaning many and gon meaning an enclosed space. So the first exercise we're, that we're going to do is look at different properties and different names of different types of polygons and see what they actually look like. So for example, a quadrilateral, which is the literal definition and name of a four-sided figure. Uh, other words that also mean quadrilateral are quadrangles and tetragon. Those are very uncommonly used, but some people do. But if we're looking for any kind of four-sided figure, well, that is the definition. Sorry, should probably have that arrow. Going to what, towards it. A quadrilateral is just any kind of four-sided figure. So if we're looking at this, I like going by numbers. So one is definitely quadrilateral. We'll get into more specifics as we keep on going through our list. Two, for sure. Three, well, that's only three sides, meaning it must be a triangle. But that's besides the point. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. Five, triangle. Six, quadrilateral. Seven, nope. Eight, yes. Absolutely it is. One, two, three, four. Nine, sure is. Ten, yep. Eleven, nah. And twelve, yes. So if we go further, a trapezoid is a quadrilateral where you have one pair of parallel sides, which means it has to be a quadrilateral, which means it cannot be the three or five or eleven. It has to be one of these numbers but well, we have to have one pair of parallel lines. You can't have two, it only has one pair. So if we look at shape number one, it has two sets of parallel lines. Well, obviously that's not gonna be a trapezoid. Two also has two sets of parallel lines. Four, well, it doesn't. Six, yeah, that line is parallel to that one, but these ones are not, therefore six is a trapezoid. Eight, nope, no parallel lines. Nine, two sets. 10, two sets. 12, yep, that is also a trapezoid. 12 is much more specifically known as a right angle trapezoid, whereas question six is just, or a, Quadrilateral six is your standard basic trapezoid. It's kind of the general form for trapezoids. Uh, parallelogram is a quadrilateral, quadrilateral whose opposite sides are parallel and opposite angles are equal. So it does one. It's a quadrilateral. The opposite sides are parallel. Yep. And the opposite angles are equal. So yes. One is a type of parallelogram. Now, obviously, we'll get further and we'll go into the more specifics. Question two, opposite sides parallel, opposite angles. Also, equal. Four, let's see, we have no equal angles and we also don't have any parallel sides in four. Question six, we do have one set of parallel lines, but we don't have two opposite sides parallel, as well as opposite angles are for sure not equal. Eight, not even. Nine, opposite sides, parallel, opposite angles, yeah, they'll be equal. Nine is a parallelogram. Parallel, equal angles, yep, 10. 12, no, it's not. 
a rhombus though, the definition is a parallelogram with equal sides. So instead of just going with this quadrilateral definition, we could have it even more specific. So because a rhombus is a parallelogram, it's going to be a quadrilateral where the opposite sides are parallel, opposite angles are equal, but the sides also have to be equal. So in order for something to be a rhombus, the sides have to be equal, but it has to be a parallelogram, which means we can not just look at these four shapes, one, two, nine, and 10, and see are the sides equal and opposite sides parallel. I guess we don't really need that opposite sides are parallel because that is the definition of a parallelogram. So we just need a parallel, parallelogram with equal sides. Let's see, equal sides, yep. Two, it's equal, it looks like all the sides are equal. Nine, eh, not all sides. Same thing with 10, not all the sides are equal. So, too bad, nine and 10. A rectangle, though, is a parallelogram where all the angles equal 90 degrees. So again, we look, just go back to parallelogram, one, two, nine, 10, are all the angles equal? So are they 90? Yeah. And one, are all these? No. Number nine? No, not 90s. 10? Yeah. So now we can go more specific. A square is a rhombus where all the angles equal 90 degrees. So rhombus, parallelogram one, two. Well, the only square in here is shape number one, which leads us into some very specific definitions of these shapes. I'm not going to expect that you're going to memorize all of them. No, a lot of them are pretty basic. Same time, you've been dealing with them for actually quite a while. You've been dealing with different things. But before we go into these kinds of things, we're going to talk about triangles. So which ones are triangles? One and two aren't. Three is. Five is. Not six. Seven is. Eight isn't, nine isn't, ten isn't, eleven is. So a scalene triangle is one of those things that we've been dealing with in previous years. It just means that it has three unequal side lengths, and because we have three unequal side lengths, it also means we have three unequal angles. Well, it has to be a triangle. Well, three, all the angles look like they're equal. And all the sides, sides are the same. So it's definitely not a scalene triangle. Five. If we were to measure it, yeah, five would probably be considered as a scalene triangle because that side looks longer than this one. That looks like our longest side. Not the hypotenuse, but it is the longest side. In section two, we talked about an isosceles triangle. So an isosceles triangle only has two equal side lengths and two equal angles. The only one that fits that between these four options, three, five, seven, eleven, would be triangle number seven or polygon number seven. An equilateral triangle. Oh, I totally missed number eleven for scaling. Sorry. Yeah, all the sides are different. <sighs> equilateral triangle. Three sides are equal, three angles are equal. Oh, well, that's going to be number three. Now, I may be going completely off script here, but I always remember is that an equilateral triangle is also known as an equilyptical triangle. So if someone is able to Google that and find that definition, that'd be great. Uh, an acute triangle, all three angles are less than 90 degrees. 
Well, that's going to be 3. 5, that's definitely bigger than, that angle right there is definitely bigger than 90 degrees. And that one looks like it's exactly 90, so that doesn't fit. So only 3 and 7 would be an acute triangle. An obtuse triangle just has one angle greater than 90 degrees. Well, that's going to be number 5. And right triangle has one angle equal to 90. That's going to be number 11. Do I expect that you memorize all of these things? No, but you should know some of these basic understandings. An isosceles triangle, for sure you need to know. Like triangles, knowing what they are, knowing what a parallel parallelogram is, sometimes even knowing what a trapezoid is, does kind of work. For foundations purposes, we don't really need to know a lot of things because we've actually been practicing them for years. You might have been three years old and learning what a square is or learning what a rectangle is, learning what a circle is. Well, we're going to have to still use that knowledge. We can't just say, oh, what's a square? That's not good. Why don't I know what a square is? Hmm. Maybe I should have paid attention. That would be useful. You know, because when you're a teenager, you try and make your voice sound really low. Make it sound like you're not, like your voice isn't going to crack. No. Ah, jeez. The audience here. All right. Second page, we talk about convex polygons being any kind of shape that no interior angles are larger than 80 degrees. 180 degrees. So basically, you don't have anything that delves inside the shape, like a concave polygon, where you have at least one angle here, one interior angle here, that's larger than 100 degree, 180 degrees. Now, if we talk about larger than the, that 180, depending on your background, you may understand that they are reflex angles, but that's not that definition doesn't really need to be explored too greatly in foundations 20. An interior angle is any angle that's on the inside of a polygon. So all of these interior angles are interior angles. Even though we have a concave polygon right here, that is still considered as one of our interior angles. Alternately, an exterior angle is an angle formed by the side of the polygon and the extension of an adjacent side. In section two, I talked about that a little bit. I talked about extending a side, but you have to extend it off the same way all around an entire polygon. The exterior angle being that outside angle. Or if we have a concave, let's see. That one, well, we're going to talk about that being our exterior angle. Same time, this one's a little bit trickier because that entire thing is going to be our exterior. So we extended that one off there. We have to extend this one off in the same direction. There, there, exterior angles. So a regular polygon. Last kind of definition before we get into some examples. Doing so good. Sorry, recording. A regular polygon is a polygon where each side is of equal length. Now, if each side is of equal length, it also means each angle is also of equal length. Now, when we talk about regular polygons, we usually do talk about convex polygons. Conca a concave regular polygon is not typically what's meant with the definition of a regular polygon. It does have to be convex where you have all interior angles smaller than 180 degrees. Some of the common names for them, 
Well, a three-sided polygon is a triangle. A four-sided polygon, yes, it's quadrilateral, but the definition of the regular polygon is a, or sorry, the standard name of that regular polygon is a square. Five-sided is a pentagon. Six, hexagon. Eight, sorry, seven, sorry. Heptagon, eight, octagon. Now, just before we keep on going any further, I do expect that these kind of names are memorized. They're not the end of the world. Any of the other ones, I usually kind of give them as a gimme. And you just have to be conscious of the fact that, yeah, there's actually official names for things. Uh, Nine-sided figure. Is an onagon. Ten, decagon. My favorite name, honest, of regular polygons are probably the twelve-sided figure, which is a dodecagon. Because it's just fun. It's just fun to say dodecagon. Eleven-sided figure is a hen decagon. A lot of these have Latin bases of them, but if you're just going to look for anything that's really specific or any kind of, sorry, not specific, general, some polygons are simply referred to by the number of sides that they have gone. For example, a dodecagon could just be a 12-gon or a 15-sided, a 15-gon. There is a specific naming sequence for them, but you just have to really, for me, pentagon, hexagon, octagon, obviously you need to know what a triangle and a square are. So there's a few facts. The exterior angles of a convex polygon will always have a sum of 380. What that means is if I were to take all of these exterior angles of this convex polygon, they will add up to be 360. For any convex polygon with n sides, the sum of the measures of the interior angles is calculated using the formula 180 multiplied by n minus 2. So n is just the number of sides that it has. So for example, if I want to find out what all of these interior angles add up to be, so that is a total sum, I would just have to take 180 multiplied by n subtract 2. So that pentagon, this formula would tell me what all of these angles added up together would be. Now, if we want to go to a regular polygon, all we have to do is find out each interior angle. So one interior angle. Again, it does have to be a regular polygon where all the sides are the same, which means that all the angles are going to be the same. We just have to divide by how many sides there are. I like giving this formula because I'm not going to make you memorize something like that. I would much rather see you apply it. Example, determine the measure of each interior angle of a regular nonagon. So if we have a nonagon, I can actually draw that. A nonagon is a nine-sided figure. This would give me all interior angles. Sorry, the sum. Of all interior angles, not angels, angles. So if I did take 180 and multiply it by 9 subtract 2, obviously following org operation, which means 9 subtract 2 is 7, the total amount of degrees in this entire figure here would be 1,260. If I want to find out each interior angle, which means I am talking about one interior angle, 
I do the exact same thing, but I divide by how many sides there are. Now, of course, I've already done this calculation for the numerator. I divide by the 9. Each of these angles here will be 140 degrees. Each and every single one of them. You'd actually be surprised how many times someone actually does do, do need to use something like this. Our second example, the sum of the measures of, of the angles in an unknown polygon is 7,920 7, degrees. Determine the number of sides that a polygon has. Now, I've usually done this in two different ways. You choose which way makes the most sense to you. So it says that the sum of the measures is 7,920, which means this formula equals 7,920. One way to isolate our n is simply to divide by 180 first. So leaving us with an n subtract 2, equaling 44 and therefore we could add two to both sides there would be 46 sides so it would be a 46 sided figure the official name the naming scheme for a 40 side fix 46 sided figure is a tetraconta chi hexagon yeah if you're wanting and you want to go for some extra credit and extra fun, check out Google and go to regular polygon naming. It does get wild the more sides that you get. The secondary way that you could do this is by distributing the 180 in. Both methods work. You choose which method works for you. Let's see. So my next step would be to add 360. Oh, don't forget the N there, sorry. So 180N would equal 8,280. I'd buy 180, double check, yeah, and still equals 46. So now we want to determine the measure of the exterior angle of a ready, regular pentadecagon. Now given the actual amount of sides, it's a 15-sided figure. Well, all of our formulas here talk about interior angles. But what does an, what is the relation between an interior angle and an exterior angle? I think I'm able to draw 15 sided. Yeah. I do this a little bit bigger just so, to actually see everything. Well, we know that in order to find out an exterior angle, we have to extend one of our sides. So the exterior angle being right there. If we are able to find out what the interior angle is, and because the exterior angle is just an adjacent side built off of the one side or off of a side, of a pentadecagon, we have a line. As soon as we find out our interior angle, we can just subtract it from 180. So our formula of 180, again, making sure you do follow order operations, 
15 subtract 2 is 13. Each interior angle will be 156. To find out the exterior angle, we just have to take 180 and subtract 156. 24. Yeah. Each exterior angle will be 24 degrees. So on our next page, we're going to talk about, again, these properties of these polygons. So we want to solve for what x is. Well, in order for us to solve what x is, we're going to have to deal with, what are they? Interior angles. Now we can also tell that this is not a regular hexagon. Six sides, one, two, three, four, five, six. Because it's not a regular hexagon, we can't say that each angle is equal which means we can't just say that they're all equal 120. What we, we can do is find out what all of the angles together would equal. 180, which will help us do further knowledge. We can tell that every single angle equals 720. Uh, sorry, every single angle added together equals 720, which means if I take 6x, add 8x, subtract 8, add 7x, add 4x plus 14, add 5x minus 6, and add 120, it will equal 720. And from there, we combine the like terms that we can. 6x's and 8x's, 14, 21, 25, 30. 30. So yeah, I'm going to start with this 120 because it's our larger number. I add 14, I'm at 134. See, subtract the 6, 128, subtract the 8. Fantastic. That's nice, easy math to work with. And then I just continue on. And solve for my x. Divide by the 30. And our x value is going to be 20. We're going to do the same kind of procedure in this other one. So we, because we have a four-sided figure, we have our 180 multiplied by 4 subtract 2. That equals 360. So all four-sided figures, squares, rectangles, so on and so forth, all of their interior angles adds, adds up to be 360, which fully makes sense, especially since if we look at any kind of square, we know that all the sides or all the angles are 90 degrees, and 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90 is 360. It doesn't matter whether each of these sides are tilted or not, especially in this shape this quadrilateral. All we have to do, oh, sorry. Let's take our 10x, add seven, add the 88, add the 5x, add three, add the 127, and it would equal 360. Combine the like terms. 10x and 5x, well, it's 15x. 7 and 88 is 95, 98, and 98 and 127 is 225.
solve for max. Fifteen x one thirty five divide by the fifteen. If I do the math in my head correctly, x should be nine. And it is. Now you might be asking, do I have to actually solve for weight each and every single one of these angles? No, it, the question just says solve for x. Again, we're just using these properties to help us solve some different problems. Again, you'll actually be surprised how often this kind of knowledge is actually used. All right, one more question. Yes, there's two of them. In A, we have to determine three angles. Well, that's actually not as bad as what you think it's going to be. One thing that is not really stated in here, but it is implied, these sides are all parallel. At the same time, because there's these lines on each of these sides, it does mean that we're dealing with a regular pentagon. So first things first, because we have a regular pentagon, it's going to be very difficult to try and deal with all of these angles together. But we can find out what one interior angle is, because that would be that angle, that angle, that angle, that angle, that angle, and then we can work from there. So in order to calculate that out, we take our pentagon, find out what one side of it would be, sorry, not what one side, one angle would be, maybe 108 degrees, and then we can go from there. So that means that that angle is 108, that angle is 108, that angle is 108, that is 108, and that entire angle right there is 108. Well, we can't just say that A and B is 108. We want to find out each individual. So let's work on it. If I'm going to solve for A first, well, I can solve for A first. A, the beautiful thing on it is that we have a triangle here. Oh, make that actually look like a triangle. Come on, make it look like a line. There we go. We have an isosceles triangle. Well, what's our properties of an isosceles triangle? Two sides are the same. And because two sides are the same, the angles across from them are also the same. How many degrees are in a triangle? 180. If we subtract that 108, we get 72. But because these two angles at the bottom here are equal, we can simply take that 72, divide it by 2, to give us 36. Meaning, angle A is 36 degrees. From there, we can keep on going. For example, we know that this entire angle here is 108. We know that A is 36, so 108 subtracting 36 is going to be 72. So angle B is 72. How about C? There's actually two ways of doing this. We can either identify that B and C, because of these parallel lines, are same side interior, meaning I could take 180, subtract the 72, to give us 108, because we could say it's a same side interior with B, or we can also just simply state that's 108, 
because it's corresponding to that 108 degree angle. So again, another method. Sorry, 108. Another method of solving the exact same thing. You don't have to solve things one at a time. You can do them a lot as individuals. So now that we've done a whole bunch of practice in this unit of solving a whole bunch of diff these different things, we're going to apply all of that kind of information here. Now there's multiple ways of doing it. For example, I know that on a straight line, there's going to be 180 degrees. If I took 180 degrees and I subtract 110, that's going to give me 70. Because this line is parallel to this line, I could therefore take 180, subtract my 70, 110. Or, understanding that that's our transversal, we have alternate interior angles, it's still going to be 110 degrees. Let's see, how about here? We have alternate interiors. Because they're alternate interior, it means that they're going to be equal. I'm going to tie in one of the things that we did in this section. For example, we have a quadrilateral here. We have a four-sided figure, which means we know that those interior angles by our work right up here are going to add up to be 360. Obviously, on an assignment, I would expect that you're going to show that calculation. But if I subtract, my 47, subtract the 110, and subtract the 70 in there, I'm going to be given 133. Obviously, there's an easier way of doing it. Because we have a straight line, these two should be supplementary. At the same time, vertically opposite angles means that they're equal. If I want to solve for this top angle up here, I just have to take 180, subtract 47, and subtract 30. See, so that's 77. That's going to be 103. Which means that this top angle here is 103 degrees. Then we can go even further. Now, even though this angle isn't stated, it's going to be the easiest thing to help us solve for this one, which means I take my 180, because we have a triangle, subtract the 80, subtract the 47, and that circle will be 53. And there we go. 